Welcome to Circuosity.21. I'm Jim Strader Sasser, and I'm one of your hosts. I'm here today with my podcast and life companion, the Reverend Dr. Hal, or Howie Sasser. And together, we're delighted that you are joining us. Circuosity.21 is our pulpit for exploring ancient and contemporary spiritual and moral themes. We engage topics with curiosity. We honor wisdom we have received from sages, prophets, martyrs, and saints from millennia ago. We enjoy learning from our friends, listeners, and especially from teachers who help us understand life better. One of our objectives as Episcopal priest is to become more spiritually alive while living more joyously and sharing what we learn with you. So welcome to our pilgrimage and thank you for traveling along with us. This is episode five in our ongoing The Beatitudes in the 21st Century podcast series and conversations of blessings on each and every one of the Beatitudes. Today we are blessed to have the Reverend Canon Mark Harris with us. Mark is a poet, a printmaker, a peacemaker, and most of all, a very talented, humorous, and wise priest. Mark comes today to have a conversation with us about Matthew's Jesus statement of blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled so thank you for joining us as we begin good morning welcome back to our podcast i am one of your hosts howell sasser and my colleague is jim strader sasser and it's great to be again with you today good morning or good afternoon or good evening to everyone who is joining us whenever that may be Uh, today we have moved on to hungering and thirsting for righteousness and we are here today with Father Mark Harris, uh, one of the, the legendary clergies, clergy members of, of recent years in the church, uh, who has uh, his own past in, in blogging and presence on, online and elsewhere in the church. And I wonder if, Mark, if you would perhaps give a, a, little, a little introduction of yourself and where you've been and what you've done. I've been a priest for 55 years, 54 years at this point. Uh, and that time has been sort of equally divided in campus ministry and then um, the support of campus ministry from a la- national level in mission service, both overseas and working at the church center with mission activities and in parish ministry. Um, so it's been a wonderfully varied career and um, on the whole, delightful in the sense that it's been filled with light. Um, I, as a child, I, I lived in Venezuela for a considerable portion of my early childhood, and then on returning lived in New Orleans until I graduated from college. And so I have both the experience of living in a very foreign environment, and then living in an environment in the States that was, let us say, retrograde in the sense that it, it was always looking back rather than forward. And, and then, of course, I went off to Bible school at the Episcopal Theological School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where um, the climate was quite different, and it was also foreign in a very different kind of direction. Uh, I've had a sense of having to learn to be at home in places that aren't really home, uh, a number of different contexts. I wonder, based on your, your dates, when you were at ETS, were you a classmate of Jonathan Myrick Daniels? Yes, well, he was a, a class ahead of in his middle year when I arrived. And mm-hmm. uh, then that spring, he went uh, with a group of people uh, down to Selma. And then he and Judy Upham, who was a classmate of mine, stayed on for that summer. And then he was um, killed that summer. Mm-hmm. Me. Beyond the uh, boundaries of your ministry in terms of your priesthood, you're also quite an acknowledged uh, poet and uh, artist. Uh, Are those things that you've accomplished throughout your life or are those recent things that you've sort of ventured into or when did you come to poetry and to pottery, I believe? Well, 
uh, it's not pottery, I, it's poetry and, and printmaking. Printmaking, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm probably in the ministry because I took seriously the poetry of the Psalms. Um, I had been a, you know, standard kid in the church. I'd been an acolyte and and along about when I was 14, I, I read for the first time the history of the Crusades, and I was so appalled that I stopped going to church. Mm. Uh, you know, the righteous indignation of the young is a wonderful thing to behold. <laughs> and I just sort of withdrew from all of that. And it, when I was 16, I, ha I was for the first time seriously in love with a young woman. And I didn't know what to do about that. I mean, I wasn't very clever. Uh, and so I was filled with sort of angst and, and desperation and I'm not worth it and, you know, blah, 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 all those things. And uh, I discovered the Psalms, which I had been reading as an acolyte, right, in church. And, but this time I discovered them as a source of consolation and mm. sort of an interior life. And that started me on the road to writing poetry. And I've been writing poetry pretty much all my life since then. Uh, the art, um, beginning actually when I was in Newark uh, at the University of Delaware, I studied um, watercolors under uh, Carol Minerick, who is a watercolorist, and, um, and did a variety of art things in relationship to my campus ministry work. And that kind of began that process, and that's gone on until um, in the early 2000s, I connected art making to poetry uh, by way of printmaking. I wanted to print my own poems in a letterpress. And so I had to learn setting type and that kind of thing. And in doing so, I got interested in illustration to go with the poetry. And so I started doing block prints to go with that. And, Voila, there I was. I was often started in printmaking. Given uh, all of those activities, uh, you've already mentioned some moments which I would consider to be blessed, but would those be the sorts of things that you would could be blessings along your way? Or do you have a, uh, a particular moment or two that you feel that you were especially blessed, however you may understand that term? Well, there's a lot of them. I mean, I think my life has been filled with kind of remarkable, for me, remarkable blessing. I see blessing uh, both as a, a gift of God, but also as a product of contentment or happiness. Mm -hmm. uh, that is to say that that side of what blessing is about, happiness. And the example that comes immediately to mind, because she's going to be coming to spend some time with us soon, is our daughter, Emma. We've been blessed kind of late in our lives by the acquisition of a new child. Um, uh, Emma, who was 21 when we adopted her and she adopted us. And uh, that's been a remark, and that was 20 years ago now. And it's been a remarkable 20 years of real blessing, real happiness. Um, Emma is, a, is an artist. Uh, actually, she, was, uh, she got an MFA in printmaking and then one in, in um, painting and now teaches and has a studio in um, Oakland, California. She being not only her, but the whole experience of engaging in this incredible relationship, she's been an amazing blessing to not only to me, but to the whole family and to um, our son, Matthew, and to his children and you know, on and on and on. It's been an amazing set of connections that grew out of what started as a fairly simple proposition. I was a student in Bucharest and I visited a small foundation in Bucharest uh, in the mid nineties. 
and I saw her talent. And she came to the States to study at the University of Delaware and Catherine and I became her sponsors. And while she was here, the relationship started to develop and we realized that what was happening is that we were beginning, we were beginning to be her parents and she was beginning to be our child. And so we took that seriously and it's been just an amazing blessing. Well, that kind of does lead us in then into the beginning of the discussion, doesn't it? What you understand blessing to mean. Uh, you had some interesting thoughts I th thought in your, your notes for today about the difference in blessing between being a state and a trait or being an active condition versus a state of being. I wonder which of those you well, think Jesus had in mind. I don't know what Jesus had in mind, but I know what, what its effect was. Uh, for me. Um, and actually, this goes back to, of all things, what I did for my Bachelor of Ministry, that used to be what they call the Master of Divinity, my Bachelor of Divinity degree, I had to write a thesis, and I wrote it on blessing and happiness. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and here's the little kind of piece that I'd like to put at the front end of this. Normally, blessing is viewed either as um, an activity that God or we do in terms of sort of naming something. Bless, you know, so blessed are you if this or that or the other thing, right? Um, and, and, and blessing is something that is done by one person to another. But if you translate this happy as opposed to blessed, and there's every good reason to say that the words that are used that we translate blessed was very easily to be translated happy. Happy are those. That's about how the person feels. It's not about something given to them. It's about something they have internally. Sure. So it's about happiness. Well, I got to exploring what is the relationship between all of these things? And there's an odd one that only shows up if you happen to be marginally a poet, which is that the word in Hebrew for happiness is ashrei or ashira, and that is related, at least phonetically, to the name for a Canaanite goddess, Asher, who is the goddess of the groves. Uh, you, you would find her in a, a grove of trees. Mm -hmm. Well, I've lived enough in hot, miserable climates in this world to know that sitting in the shade of the tree is absolute blessedness in the heat of the day, mm. to sit in the shade. And if you recall from the Psalms about Happy is the one who's, who sits in the rafters of the temple, right? Like a, like a sparrow up in the rafters of the temple. Happy is the one who is in this shade. And it made me think that perhaps happiness is about being contented. It's not about either giddiness or amazing gifts of some sort. Blessed are you if you are rich and famous. You know, it's not about that. And it's not about happy are you if you just have enough cocaine to snort and you can giggle a lot. Uh, you know, happiness is, a, it's about contentment. So in my mind, one of the ways to look at the Beatitudes is content are you if mm -hmm. such and such. A little bit of my understanding of the Beatitudes is that they had to do with with describing um, the conditions for kind of holy contentment, for being content, right? Um, being settled. So the question as to whether or not Jesus was talking more about something where he gave a blessing or God gives a blessing, or whether he was saying something more about a condition 
that people are in if they feel, fall into one of these categories. I am not sure which way that one goes. To follow up with that, because uh, speaking specifically to a hunger and thirst for righteousness sake, uh, to be content in that process is paradoxical, at least to me, to struggle for something or to yearn for something is, I think of it as being dynamic. I suppose one is content while one is doing that, uh, but that's probably not the word I would use to uh, describe that particular activity. Yeah, um, I, think, I think you're exactly right. The example I've got for what I think I mean by this whole thing is um, the first time I ever saw Desmond Tutu, he had come to speak at the General Convention in New Orleans in 1982. Uh, he was a bishop, he was not yet the archbishop, uh, and he was an emerging voice in the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. And he came and he gave this speech. And in it, he said something to the effect of, you know, it's already, it's done. Apartheid will in fact fail because apartheid is evil. And evil will not in fact win out over good. All we're doing is talking about the details. Hmm. It, it will end. And, and he said this with not triumph, but with kind of, I would say, a kind of contentment. That is to say, the struggle, we got to, the struggle is still there. We've still got to do it. But we live content in the knowledge that the struggle is in fact going to be resolved for the just and the good. There was a confidence there that, that just sort of exuded kind of a sense of, I'm content in the struggle because I know the struggle will be won. But people who live closer to the kingdom than I mm. can do have a sense of that blessedness which is not dependent on the specifics of my action or your action, but rather a, are, are, are based on the unfolding of the whole thing. Beginning, I was wondering whether the contentment and hungering and thirsting for righteousness implied the need for fulfillment, or if one was supposed to be satisfied with the struggle. But it sounds like it's really neither of those. Rather, it's with, if I understand you correctly, it's more in a sense that the ultimate conclusion is foregone. And so, although the struggle continues and we find ourselves engaged with it, uh, the ultimate promise of fulfillment is where the contentment lies. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Uh, one of the ways I thought about this specific uh, beatitude was to think about it as a, a beatitude of striving. Hmm. Um, that that it, unlike some of the beatitudes which seem static, I mean, blessed are the meek, that's about a group of people who fit the description of being meek, however you want to put that together. But, but blessed are the striving, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. You're, you're saying that this, this creative urge, this drive, this desire is itself a source of blessing. Years ago, I was related to a community in Philadelphia called uh, the Movement for a New Society and uh, essentially consisted of a bunch of Quakers who lived in uh, communal settings. There were seven or eight houses in Philadelphia. And, and they uh, were striving to live out the simplicity of the Quaker way and to work for the justice of, in society, which they viewed as being equally communal and simple in its character. So they worked for social change in, in, in the city while living it out as, as small communities. Well, of course, I don't know whether you've ever lived in a small community, but actually it's hard work. 
it's actually almost as hard work as trying to change the city of Philadelphia's justice system. I mean, it's, it, you know, how do you work out justice in your family? It turns out to be a full-time occupation for which if you're not careful, you can get buried in, in depression and angst and worry and, and disappointment. But if in fact you love the community, then it seems to me you look not to the present, but to the fulfillment of the promise of what that love could be about. So justice workers who see in a way that kind of eschatological triumph, see justice work, I think, in an entirely different way than people who think that justice depends specifically on their action and nobody else's. Do you think that's easier to do in community than it is alone? Is it easier to maintain that sort of vision when you have others around you or does that begin the messiness of the process the minute there's another person in the picture? I don't know. I've tried it both ways. Catherine and I lived in community for 10 years um, with a group of five or six other adults and a couple of kids, my own and one other kid. And there have been blessings of that that have continued on into the present. That was 40 years ago. And we still are very, very close friends with three couples that came from that community. Uh, they met in that community and then got married to each other. Um, and, in, and in living together, we worked out something of, of what we felt like was a fairly just community that was working for a kind of a larger vision of what it would be like to live together in, in the world. It was hard, uh, but the blessings were amazing in that process. Okay, I've done it that way. I've also lived alone a fair amount. And, um, and I find that amazingly freeing in terms of complications. <laughs> Community life is complicated. Uh, and there are blessings that come from that as well. But I think it's, it's um, these things are sources of happiness or blessing. They're, they are, the things that you have to bear in the moment are bearable because you live in, you live in a love which is, which is not temporally bound mm. to your own failures or successes. That, that out of this, uh, somehow justice and mercy will meet together, uh, that, you'll, that you'll do right by each other and you'll be accountable to each other and there will be mercy, right? So that kind of combination of that part of righteousness that has to do with justice and that part of righteousness that has to do with mercy we see that as part of our vision about relationships, I think. So it seems to me that community presses us. Uh, it's not enough to be just, you have to be merciful as well, that the two are combined and that, and that righteousness is a matter of ex exhibiting both justice and mercy. I'm content when I'm working to make things better. Hmm. I I cannot rest in I cannot rest until I work at this. That kind of that kind of approach uh, where contentment is not about being at rest, but being um, at the right work, doing the right work. There's some hmm. interesting hints that come from entirely different places about this. A little book on on Chinese written characters, 
and one of them has to do with the word for right for good government and good government consists says this little book in the rectification of names oh. that is to say to justly and rightly naming things for what they are hmm. and and i thought about that in terms of this business about justice you know justice is like holding people accountable for who they are and what they do so if i'm a thief naming me as a thief is part of what justice is about giving things their right names the combination of that with giving things their right names and then saying oh thief i have compassion for you mm. or mercy for you is is so the activity is both naming the thing naming the world for what it is naming the events for what they are and then responding to them in ways which are sort of opening to further engagement to further blessing to further possibilities so there's always an active character to these well that was one thing the other piece was uh there was a there was a play uh, that came that was put together in the 60s called Paradise Now. And mm -hmm. it's a play that's totally interactive between the audience and the and the players on the on the stage. Uh, it was meant to be interactive and therefore there's no script for the play. There is a script about the script. Uh, the, the players are all poised to open a dialogue essentially with the audience and and one of the pieces of that dialogue has to do with the, the actors ask what do you want and then they begin to spell out various kinds of things um, i want to be able to be free i want to be able to go anywhere i want without a passport i want to be able to love whoever it is i want to love you know that kind of stuff right the last person who speaks says, when they ask, what do you want? He says, I want to make the destination clear. And, and then, and then the, the prime speaker among the, the actors asks a set of questions, the last of which is, um, what do we call this, this condition of desiring, right? What do we call this condition of the desiring? Paradise now is the answer. Well, all of our striving, it seems to me, in this in the beatitude that has to do with, with blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, is, is a kind of way of looking at the issue about what do you want? What we want is that end now. So striving for this stuff is in itself a participation in that want being fulfilled. So it's a blessing to be able to work on issues of justice because that's what we want, right? I mean, mm. so there's a kind of intimate relationship between this desire and the action and feeling content. I am doing exactly what I need to be doing about changing the nature of the world. And that feels good. That mm -hmm. feels like a source of blessing. That brought up for me a, a question linking this with the Gospel of John, where at my laughably simple level of understanding, we're told that we're to understand that the kingdom of God is not just a future event, but is a present event. In some ways, it's it's being revealed even now. So I wonder if, if in part what you're saying is that the work of justice is not even so much working for something that is a future paradise being brought in some mechanical way into the present, but rather is a revelation of that paradise that is already among us, but goes unnoticed. I think that's very helpful. They, I think that's quite true. Time, time, it seems to me, is an invention that has not served us well in terms of some things. Um, mm -hmm. 
um, you know, to think that we work for, we strive for something that is only in the future and will always only be in the future uh, seems like I, I, the people that I know who are really serious justice workers are quite often tired because it's hard work. And they sometimes are really discouraged because it doesn't always work out very easily or well. But the ones who are really good at it also live with the presence of that future somehow actually available to them right now. Doing justice happens even if injustice continues. So it's a present activity, not a, it's not, it is a future activity in terms of vision, but the truly visionary, uh, just as you say, sees it now. I think if not, it's, it's far too depressing even to imagine. I mean, when any job is so large, you can't even imagine getting your arms around it. Uh, you have to imagine that somehow you're not doing it all by yourself. In, in our current circumstances, in a way you would have to be a fool not to be depressed and discouraged. The powers and principalities of this world really do seem to be on a roll. And the possibilities for justice for the poor uh, seem to be fading all the time. So you must be a fool. Well, it turns out the revelation of John and the eschatological vision is that at the close, even with great struggle, justice and mercy, which are, are components of God's inner being, prevail. They just do. And if you live with that certainty at that end, then what you see is instead of disaster, you see constant moments of resurrection of that hope again and again and again. Any rate. Taking that as my cue, I wonder if I can take things in a slightly different direction. Good. Uh, one of my pet projects in this, this, this podcast series has been to, to give the listeners something that they can take away and use. Uh, how does the person in the pew take this and use it in his or her life? And I would preface it by saying that my sense looking at the world is that there are multiple competing righteousnesses. Mm. There is a righteousness of power. There is a righteousness of violence. There's a righteousness of consumerism. Uh, there's a righteousness of the self. Uh, each of these could be set up as a false god of sorts to tell us what right behavior, right desire, right action is. How does the average Christian arrive at some understanding of what righteousness means in his or her own context? Mm. Mm. Okay. A small question. Yeah, just a little little small question there. No big, no big deal. Um, efforts on our part to be righteous as if we knew what the what right action would finally look like are pretense that righteousness is about the combination of conscience and obedience. To be obedient to God is to be open to God pushing us in, in new directions or opening up things for us in ways that we don't actually think of right now. Um, to be, to be obedient to God is to, to not be blocked off into righteous beliefs, but rather to be open to the working of the spirit. So you've got that piece on one side. Then you've got the matter of conscience. And conscience is much more about what I think, not about 
being obedient to God, but about what I think I ought to do. What ought I to do? Well, I think the beginning is, is to be obedient to God, not to be obedient to any of those idols, like self-worth, or I know what's right, or the constitution is the be all and end all of everything, or, uh, you know, or, or any other set of doctrines or beliefs. The scripture is right, to, Jesus is right to finally say that the only unforgivable sin is the sin against the Holy Spirit. Mm. That, if you, that if you were blocked off by some feeling of righteousness, such that you're not able to hear or see what God is doing or where the destination is going, uh, then you're just blind as a bat, right? You, you, you are not, in fact, in a, in a righteous relationship with God. And sometimes we get pretty close to doing what's right. At least I'm speaking from my own experience. Sometimes I get fairly close to doing what is right. And sometimes I just blow it entirely. But, but in terms of conscience, I make the effort to try to do what I believe is right. But I cannot confuse that with being righteous. That's sort of like saying in the only proper approach, it seems to me, to a relationship with God is to finally say, I did as well as I could. And I know that, in fact, your call is greater than that. Right. Mm, I mean, mm. I, I, I tried to do good, but, you know, doing good and doing God is not the same. I mean, I do what I can, but but being obedient to you is an entirely different matter. So it seems to me that being righteous, and here's, to put it in the form of a takeaway, I would say the takeaway is do the best you can knowing that God will hold you accountable and be merciful both. talked about the word covenant a bit and this this search for righteousness to me does feel relational in some ways and i was thinking about matthew's context and and the fact that you know these beatitudes are grounded in the torah which is grounded in the sense of god is in covenant with the jewish people god is in covenant with the descendants of abraham and sarai and uh and that whole process if you will begins with Abra with God saying, Abraham, go over there, <laughs> you know, go over there and, and take your family with you. And Abraham just kind of picks up the whole tense. Uh, and I don't know that that's righteousness, but it certainly is righteousness to the extent that it is, it is uh, one of the patriarchs trying to do God's will as best as he can based upon what he hears God saying. I think that's right on target. You know, the, the, it, was, it was counted to him as righteousness, which is, you know, he listened, he heard, he did what he was told, good enough. I was fascinated in Amy Levine's book on uh, the kingdom of God and on specifically on the Beatitudes. She begins the book, which is about the whole of the Sermon on the Mount, the first thing out of the book, right in the beginning of the first, of the forward, really, uh, is a comment about this specific beatitude, namely the beatitude, uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And she recalls in that context, uh, the hunger and thirst of Old Testament uh, women in the patriarchal period mm. uh, who in fact hunger and thirst for righteousness. But I thought it was fascinating to me that, that that's the beginning place for her commentary because it exactly is about Torah, which is on the one hand, a recitation of kind of the roadmap 
for what God's righteousness would look like in practice, combined with the absolutely incessant understanding that God's mercy needs to be accompanied, God's justice needs to be accompanied by God's mercy, or else the whole thing is just, will be a shambles. Because in the face of, in the face of the commandments and in the face of the Torah, there's no perfection possible. Therefore, we're in need of understanding by God of the fact that we, after all, are kind of a screwball bunch of people who do things wrong. But, you know, so, so we live with judgment and mercy both, and that's the covenant. The covenant is not about, here's the law, if you do it, everything's fine, if you don't, you're damned. I think the covenant is about, here's the law, live in it. Those kinds of hints that we should love the law. Loving the law is very different from doing it. Right? It's, I mean, if you love it, you want to try to do it, but you know perfectly well, at least I know from the experience of loving people, that that's very different from actually doing right by them. I mean, mm. sometimes it comes close, but it's not the same thing as acting justly all the time. Um, but to love the law seems to me to be precisely what Jesus is pushing at. Uh, in the striving. So it seems to me that this really is a beatitude of desire. It's the desire to stand right in relationship with God. I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Um, I, think that, I yeah, think that's exactly. what you have to, maybe Q, I can't remember, but yeah. And I, and I think that's it, uh, or at least that's a part of it, whatever it is, unless your righteousness is greater of that than the Pharisees and the scribes. And I think Matthew kind of points towards this notion that there's this expansion that is required uh, in the in the doing of it, in the being of it, you know, or at least the attempts to expand it. I really like the um, Levine's understanding of of Jesus as living into or living out the implications of the love of God by way of obedience to God's law combined with doing the works of righteousness and living in humility. When I look at the heroes I, I have in, in terms of justice ministries, it's those kind of people people who, who live into this to the point of self-emptying. They, they get out of the way finally. Uh, it's not about their being good. It's about good being done. Mm. So it's God's justice that's done, not them doing justice. Uh, they, they try. They do pretty good at it. They do a hell of a lot better at it than I do. But they finally see this as being a thing which will empty themselves out and for that matter everybody else who tries to do justice work invitation to people that they too can on their own decide to stand on a street corner and name out loud what they believe to be the truth and call that an act of justice is really quite powerful I really liked the format. Uh, we Anglicans do have kind of an interesting approach to scripture and the way in which it relates to worship and to action both. And you really hit on some of that. And I think that's very much what I was thinking about in terms of this specific beatitude. Um, Stringfellow's book on conscience and obedience is exactly a spelling out of those two very different sides, the same um, 
force of the Beatitudes, that they all involve an acknowledgement of the centrality of, of God and therefore the need for worship and for engagement on that level. But they also call us to action so that if we say blessed are the meek, for example, we're not only saying something about where God's blessing is to be found, but also saying something about our need to relate to the people whose meekness is either by choice or by condition and, and to relate to them in ways which reflect God's blessing. And so I thought you did a really great job of, of lining up the beatitude with something about Anglican prayer and worship and then something about the understandings of what that entails in terms of our action. So that's kind of a shout out to that way of approaching the Beatitudes in general. And I hope I got your approach about right. Um, <laughs> did I come close? Yes, I think so. That was what I was that's intending. Right. <laughs> I wasn't, I haven't really thought about this till like this broadcast of how people who sort of in broader terms fall into one category of being blessed can interact and engage with other people who are blessed as well. So the thirst for righteousness might lead someone like one of us to say, there is a group of people over here that are mourning. And so our quest for righteousness, our quest for being in right relationship with God is to, um, is to cross the bridges of the verses, if you will, into the, into the community of those who are mourning or those who are seeking to, to create peace. And I, I don't know that I've really thought about the synergy between the interactions of those persons who are who Jesus names as blessed, other than the fact that Jesus will sum it all up by saying, blessed are you, you know? So um, I just find that really curious and I hadn't given it much thought. That's a really helpful thing. Um, um, when I worked in the Philippines, one of the places that we we visited, this was an ecumenical group, um, was with a community that lived on the edge of one of the garbage heaps in Manila. These garbage heaps are huge and fires get started in them and they just go on for years and years and years. So there'll be smoke and, 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 and rotted food and, and huge piles of plastic. And, and there are people on the edge of these garbage heaps whose lives whose livelihood consists of sorting the garbage into various categories and then selling those things to purveyors of one sort or another. Uh, so you, you, you gather all the metal together and you sell it to a metal um, supply place. Um, the people who live in these conditions live in real poverty and, and they also live uh, under really poor health conditions. Um, but they are a community and they developed a community and they began to express their needs for rights and for, for access to healthcare and um, things like being able to have electrical service for their little community, which wasn't there before. And they would, they would petition and, 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 and demonstrate and finally get from the city needed resources. Uh, and, and, they worked to make the city understand too that the city was dependent on them. I mean, who was going to clear up all this mess if it wasn't them, right? So our visiting them was to encourage their work and to hear their work. But it in turn made us understand that their blessing had consequences for us. Because when we saw them organize, we looked at the kinds of principles around which they were organizing themselves and the extent to which they were organized as a faithful community, trying to work for the greater good of all. It was, a, the synergy was there. So here we were going to visit the meek right, or, or the poor, um, and discovering in that process 
that we were gaining from them the energy of their promise for community that they could organize. You know, we may be poor, but we're organized, right? <laughs> we're 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 not we we may be poor and down and out, but we're not done with. Mm. You know, mm. we have we have life and energy and joy and we're on a move. <laughs> and that in turn became energizing for some of us who were who were involved in peacemaking ministries in the Philippines. I'm looking at the clock and thinking where my next thing is. Uh, maybe we should head toward wrapping up. When Jesus saw the crowds, he sat down, his disciples came to him and he began to speak. And he taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Okay. Sort of a sum up a little bit. Um, I was interested that the phrase, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, but they will be filled, uh, is related to blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, I think there's a connection between being filled and having the kingdom of heaven. And it's achieved in an odd and strange way by being persecuted. Mm. Uh, I hunger and thirst, I, I desire to be righteous. I'll know that I'm be getting there if I get persecuted, mm. right? And therefore, in some ways, will know by my persecution that I'm on the right road. Mm. One of the things that is very strange about uh, righteousness as a, a seeking is that we, at least I know from personal experience, that that's a torturous path. I don't pretend to have had enough influence on the world to where the persecution is the persecution by the great powers. The persecution I get is much smaller. Uh, being misunderstood, for example. I try to, to go on the path of righteousness and I get held accountable but I also get misunderstood and get hounded and harassed by friends and enemies alike for being such a jerk, right? <laughs> and that constitutes a persecution as well. The persecution doesn't have to be big. It's not about, it's not necessarily about uh, you try to do great, you're gonna get strung up and executed. It can also be about you try to do right and people are just going to laugh at you. Or you try to do right and your friend said, well, good luck. You really screwed that one up. Mm. Right? There's lots of little persecutions that happen to us. There's a lot of ways in which roadblocks get put in our way that try to convince us that actually we're dismal failures. So one of the persecution pieces that our Lord had to deal with was the people who laugh at him on the cross. You jerk. You thought you were doing right and here you are dead, right? Persecution is, is I think, a matter of ingesting the poison of those who think that justice is a fool's errand, mm -hmm. that, that, that doing the will of God is a stupid enterprise. And that if it doesn't kill you with the electric chair or the cross, 
it will kill you by derision and, and irrelevance. My guess is that my persecution, it will be by irrelevance. People will say, oh yes, that, <laughs> right? What, what value was that, right? Living into the far side of that, living with, with the notion that God will in fact prevail, that justice and mercy really are there and will show themselves eventually. I think that's the core of our faith. So this hunger and thirst for righteousness is accompanied by or requires this core faith that the vision, the vision of God's justice and mercy is a reality. We see it now, it will be true later. Too bad about the jokes, too bad about the derision, you know, too bad about the electric chair, too bad about the cross, it will prevail. All right, friends, I hope this is helpful and useful to you. Yeah, thank you. It's been great. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Mark. And uh, yeah, stay out of the crowds down there and uh, enjoy the evening <laughs> you breeze. <got> it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you for joining us. Please share our podcasts with your friends, family, and anyone traveling along the way seeking wisdom and hope in these extraordinary times. There are many resources associated with this podcast series. Most of the commentaries, comments, and other thought-provoking materials are available at Beatitudes.online. We have a subscribers list you can sign up for, too. This series and earlier podcasts of ours are located at circuosity.podbean.com. Check it out and we invite you to follow and like us on Facebook. Please let us know if you'd like for us to share information with you and your faith communities, either virtually or with other forms of promotional material. Next time on the Beatitudes in the 21st Century, Howie and I sit down with the Right Reverend Carly Hughes, who is the Episcopal Bishop of the Diocese of Newark in New Jersey, and she will be talking with us about Matthew 5, 7, and blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. This is a really great conversation, and Bishop Hughes gives us the full view of what it means to be a bishop in the Episcopal Church in a context where the needs for mercy are very, very plentiful, and the merciful disciples of Jesus are plentiful as well. One final note, during this podcast, Mark Harris mentioned that Howie had created a booklet uh, on this podcast series material, and you can find that on the Pilgrim's Food webpage on our Beatitudes.online site. So go find that, and we will see you next time. Blessings along the way. Well, I wanted to make a shout out uh, for how his book on the Beatitudes uh, produced for campus ministry work. One of the shout outs is, I don't know who did the graphics, but they're really great. Thank you. So, super simple, but really fine. Did you do those graphics? I did, yes. Yeah. Well, they're really fine. Thank uh, you. One of the things I like about them is that they're suggestive without having any direct con uh, content in terms of image. Uh, 
the, the little lines and the triangles and the, I mean, those little graphics are really wonderful. Uh, that was part of the shout out, but the rest of it was, 